welcome Hoosier fans to another victorious episode of the Assembly Call as today your Indiana Hoosiers do it again, winning another close game as Rob Fennessy hits the big shot again, a last second three-pointer to give Indiana a 71-68 to victory over Butler in a game in which Butler really controlled the action for most of the game. And just kind of based on the eye test, you, know, you really felt like Butler was playing a lot better than Indiana. Uh, I know, you know, Indiana's you know, only down by four late. And I remember writing down, how are we only down by four? And yet this team once again finds a way to make plays late. They get stops, they get rebounds, and then they make the big shots late to win the game. And Rob Finnessy, his nickname is Big Shot Rob. Don't say anything to me. That is it. He made another one. Just an unbelievable finish for Indiana. I'm your host, Jared Morris. I'm here with Ryan Phillips. We are going to break this all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. And let's start today's show as we start every show. And that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner moment. Look, you make a hey, Jared. 30. What are you What are you going to go with on this? Uh, <laughs> well, what are you okay. Go with on this banner moment. What's look, moment? look, look. I, I will I say this. Imagine what you're going to go with. I will say this. Obviously, the biggest moment of the game is Rob Finnessy making another three. And again, just the stones on that kid to just continue to step up in big moments, time after time you know, and make them, it's just huge. And so, you know, to do that, I mean, it was, it was kind of a broken play. Indiana didn't even look like it was going to get a shot off. He ends up making it. I will say, though, I want to go to the play before because, you know, that, that was what I had written down before the craziness of that final play. But, you know, once Indiana took the lead at 66 to 64, they had a couple of really disjointed offensive possessions. Zach McRoberts takes a wild three on one. Romeo Langford chucks up a quick three that's an air ball. And Archie Miller took a timeout. His team's dis disjointed. He takes a timeout. And Indiana comes out of that timeout, and they really ran a nice offensive action. It was intended to get Romeo or Juwan the ball. Butler was did a nice job defensively of denying them the ball, not letting them get it. Indiana stayed patient. Rob Finnessy stayed patient because he was the guy handling the ball, drove the baseline. Justin Smith makes a really smart cut, gets the dunk. And, you know, that, that put Indiana back ahead. And so it was nice to see, you know, Indiana be disjointed. They go over, they regroup with their coach, and they come out and run a really nice set. You know, maybe that's why Archie's teams are good in close games, because he can settle them down, run good sets, and get, and get going. And again, you know, who's the guy making the plays late? Rob Finnessy is the guy with the assist. And then, of course, the guy who hits the game-winning three. So, you know, this is just a really interesting game, because Indiana did so many things wrong and the game did not go according to script for what you would have thought for an Indiana victory, and yet they won it anyway, and we're excited, obviously, to break it all down here as we kind of catch our breath from that incredibly uh, exciting and exhilarating ending. All right, today's Hoosier Proud banner moment brought to you, as always, by our friends at Hoosier Proud and Home Field. At homefieldapparel.com, you will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel, like the Tri-Blend hoodie I bought recently that I love. It features the old Bison logo. I wear it way too much, but that's because it's so comfortable. Definitely consider that one for yourself or for someone else for Christmas. And then over at HoosierProud.com, you will find great State of Indiana-themed apparel as well as our official Assembly Call logo shirts. Both brands, Hoosier Proud and Home Field Apparel, were started by an IU grad, and all apparel at both sites is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And with Christmas on the way, you should consider finding the perfect holiday gift for the IU fan or Indiana resident in your life at homefieldapparel.com and at hoosierproud.com. And remember, the deadline for delivery by Christmas is December 19th, so do not wait to order. Can a brother get some coupons? Yes, don't forget to use the promo code ASSEMBLY at checkout today for 15% off your order on either site. That's promo code ASSEMBLY at HoosierProud.com and HomeFieldApparel.com. All right, well, it is time to move the ball, find the open man, and get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. It's a one-man crew today, or two-man crew, I guess. Over to Ryan Phillips. Ryan, your uh, your opening thoughts on this Indiana victory. Well, I'd just like to say, you know, my game ball is going to go to Archie Miller for drawing up just a phenomenal play at the end that clearly <laughs> worked. Uh, but no, I think, I think the takeaway from this game is that IU, and I, I just tweeted this out, is that IU is a team with flaws that need to be ironed out. It is not perfect. But the one thing you have to give this team credit for is they never quit. They fight. And and other than the Duke game, they have fought insanely hard in every situation they've been in. Now, in Duke, they got run off the floor by a much more talented team in a really difficult situation. But they were down 11 in the second half to, today, and just it, it didn't seem to phase them. They just kept fighting and just kept fighting, and they hit big shots, and they find ways to win. And let's face it, other than the Arkansas game, in tight games late, they've won. And quite frankly, that Arkansas game was stolen from them. 
And you look at everything they did today with all the, you know, and, and, and I thought it, just to be fair, cause I, I'm, we're going to get into this a little bit. I thought the officiating was bad both ways on a lot of things. I thought they ignored, you know, a lot of contact and then would call ticky tack contact. I thought the offensive foul calls against Indiana were horrific. Um, I thought a couple times to be fair, Indiana, I thought fouled guys on jump shots and they didn't call it. Um, so I, I, it was bad both ways, but to persevere through all of that and, and just a disjointed game where it never seemed like it was weird from the get go. I don't know if there was something with the ball they were using, but I, just did not seem to have a great handle on the ball all day, you know, not necessarily just turning the ball over, but they'd be dribbling and the ball would kind of bounce funny. And it just didn't look like they were locked in all day yet. They kept battling and battling and battling and battling and put themselves in a position to win the game. Late. Now, if you lose that game close, you're you're bummed about it and we're nitpicking all the all the problems which we will get into the problems because mm-hmm. they're there but if you lose that game it, it's just such a downer but at least you fought back at least you muscled your way into that game at least you locked down defensively over the last 5 to 10 minutes and really forced butler to do some things and make some tough shots before that that didn't exist but this team really locked in late and I'll tell you what, it's much better to have a team that closes well than opens well. I don't care if they get down 10 in every game, if they close like this. Um, and and that's just sort of what has become the DNA of this team is that they close hard and and they they really don't give up. And, and I also think it's, it's interesting that if you look at the points distribution and everything, I mean, obviously this was the Juwan Morgan game, uh, but if you look at the distribution, they're winning differently every time it seems. And, and they're, you know, today was a completely unbalanced effort. Whereas in the past, it's been pretty balanced efforts and it's been Romeo and Juwan leading the way, but then, you know, you get four points out of everybody or, you know, four to 10 points out of pretty much everywhere up, up and down the roster that didn't happen today. And you feel like those other guys are going to bounce back and things will get better. But I just, I'm, I'm so impressed with Archie Miller, first of all, being able to get these guys to believe they can win any game and for these guys to just keep fighting and keep pushing back and then to overtake it late. I, I, um, this did not feel like a game that I, you would win. No, uh, for we led of, for a minute 33. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 but you know what, this didn't feel like a game. I, you would win the Arkansas didn't game. Didn't no. feel like a game. I, you would win the Penn state game. Didn't feel like a game. I, you would win, but, there's a thing now is that we're conditioned to a different type of IU team and from the past decade or whatever. This is a new era and it's a new culture and it's a new situation. And they're starting to change things to where you're kind of getting confident if it's tied late. And uh, it's just really impressive. And I, I kudos to the team for fighting through today. Yeah, it's one of those things you almost hope they don't get too confident with kind of being able to come back from these sluggish starts, <laughs> you know, because it's like, yeah, you know, we can come out, not really play hard and tough for the first five, 10 minutes of the game. We'll find a way to win it late because that's what they've been doing in these recent games. But they found a way to do it. Now, look, you know, one of the challenges of a post game show when you have an emotional ending like that is we come on here and our focus is on the ending as we kind of catch our breath and get going with maybe a little bit more time. We would have opened with, you know, the MVP of this game, the guy who absolutely kept Indiana alive for you know 38 minutes tonight before you know obviously his 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 teammates kind of took over there late and and put the finishing touches on it but Jawan Morgan offensively today was just outstanding you know he finishes with 35 points it's the second straight season that he's just put Indiana on his back in the Crossroads Classic I mean if he wasn't playing at an all-American level in the first half Indiana's probably down by 20 and that's not an exaggeration I mean he was everything And I think, you know, three things really stand out from his offensive performance today. Number one, seven for seven from the free throw line. That's huge. And obviously, every single one of them was important. Number two, four of six from downtown. You know, he's, I don't know what his three-point percentage is now for the season. It might be at about 50%. You know, I think he had gone four or five straight games without making one, got back to hitting the threes. Every single one of them was huge. That's good to see. And 12 of 14 on, you know, field goals. You know, Ryan, last year, you know, we saw him just be able to dominate down low. And as good as his footwork was last year, it's even better this year. And his ability to finish with his left hand is better. Like, he has really improved his skills. And Archie said it on the pregame show to to Fish. He said, look, I think we really have an advantage and we get the ball down on the block against these guys. And Juwan proved that today because for large swaths of this game, he was the entire offense. Now, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, that's not going to be sustainable in a lot of games. But today it was enough and absolutely a tip of the cap to Juwan Morgan, the clear MVP. He played like an All-American today. 
you know, defense left a little bit to be desired. His rebounding wasn't great, but he carried such a huge load on offense. You can nitpick that stuff fine. They needed every single yeah. ounce of what he brought offensively, and he was terrific. He was also in a bad matchup defensively for a while with McDermott, who is just a guy who runs off screens and stands on the perimeter, and Juwan always wants to help defensively, and he kept getting sucked inside, and McDermott nailed six threes. I mean, at some point, you know, there was that one he hit late on the break, which happens because you got to run back and protect the goal and then locate out. So Justin Smith kind of got caught in the middle. I thought Smith did a much better job on him than Morgan did. He did. Uh, just because athletically he's more in tune with being able to stay out on a guy like that and have the length and size to get to recover to him. But Juwan, you're right. I mean, it was, I think it was the performance of his career, 12 of 14 from the field. And the two misses were three pointers. Every shot he took inside the three point line he made. That's just insane. And that includes the seven free throws he hit inside the three point line. He didn't miss anything. And uh, he was, he was just on fire. And um, four of those turnovers, I think one, was he one was a pass where he and Romeo miscommunicated. Uh, there are going to be you possess the ball that much, you're going to turn the ball over. It it happens, but yeah, just a fantastic game. And he stayed out of foul trouble. He got an early foul and was yep. able to stay out of foul trouble. And we've seen this year with Juan Morgan when he stays out of foul trouble, he's really good. He's he's unstoppable on the block right now. He has not played anybody who can stop him on the Nobody. block. They might be able to hold him at bay a little bit. But his ability to cross the lane and finish with both hands, I mean, that's sort of his go-to move is he fakes down low and then crosses the front of the lane and finish with both hands is is fantastic. I'm not sure there's anybody better at it in the country right now or playing to that level on the block in the country right now. This dude is an All-American. He's an All-Big Ten guy. There's no question in my mind if he stays consistent this year. Obviously, he's not going to score 35 points every game, but if he stays consistent with the way he attacks the rim and Indiana continues to feed him, and there was a concerted effort to feed him today because nobody could stop him, and I really like that adjustment to just go. Give it to him. I don't care who's on him. I don't care if he's getting doubled. Just give him the ball, and they did, and Juwan's a smart enough player. They need to have faith in him that if he is getting doubled, he'll find the open guy. And we've seen him do that this year. So I, I thought, you know, just a great performance from Juwan. And, uh, you know, he's he's one of the best in the in the country at what he does. And there's we need to appreciate that while he's here, uh, especially when you had a guy like yeah. Romeo Lankford, I thought had a really uneven game. Uh, and I thought some of the other guys like Al Durham had a really uneven game. But uh, you know, and Deron Davis didn't really get it going today. I mean, there's just a couple guys who just didn't get it going, and Juwan just seemed comfortable taking the load and sort of carrying the team. It was, uh, it was fantastic. It was really well, uh, really well done for Juwan today. Yep, you know, plenty to talk about with guys like Al and, and Devontae as we move forward. But I, I want to talk real quick about Romeo. I thought Butler defended him really well. I mean, they bodied him up. They were tough. They denied him the ball. And he, I mean, he didn't even get going for about the first 10 minutes of the game, you know, and really didn't quite look as engaged as we've seen him. He looked out of it a little bit. Yeah. Now, now he ended the not first half strong. And, and, you know, this is the thing with Romeo. He was not on his game today, but he was productive. 13 points. He had seven boards. You know, for a little while, he was the only guy really rebounding tough for Indiana. So I will give him credit for that in the second half because Indiana was not rebounding tough. I thought, you know, in the first half, I thought Butler had the lead because they were just quicker to spots. They were tougher to spots. They were getting every loose ball. And that's a problem. I mean, it's the same thing that happened against Louisville. And I think Indiana needs to figure out why that keeps happening in first halves. You know, but again, but Romeo found a way to be productive. He had four assists. He had a couple of blocks. Now, he did have the five turnovers, and he and Juwan Morgan had some just atrocious passes in the second half. <laughs> again, you know, it, given the other things that they provided, you're kind of okay with it because no one else was really creating offense. Um, but we got to clean that up. But I thought for Romeo, you know, it, it's – I have to think that kind of how Butler defended him is how is the kind of defense he's going to start seeing more. I mean, you're, they're going to play tough. They're going to deny him the ball because when he gets the ball, he's so tough to stop going to the basket. You know, I think Butler really did a nice job defensively of making us settle for the shots that they wanted us to settle for when it wasn't Juwan getting it on the block. And I think Robio fell prey to that a little bit with some of the threes that he settled for. So this was not a great day for him. But, you know, he did make a big bucket late. And again, I thought had some really key rebounds. So he wasn't terrible by any means. But I think this is a game he really needs to learn from because I think he will see this kind of defense moving forward. Yeah, offensively, I thought he looked like a freshman today for a lot of the game. Yeah. Uh, he, he wound up with, five, with four assists. Uh, two block shots, both on recoveries defensively that I thought were really nice. Uh, as you said, seven rebounds. Uh, so there were some positives there, but the five turnovers were unacceptable. He was just forcing passes. It's almost like he was he he thought he had to make a play. 
every time he had the ball when, you know, what we've seen from Romeo is a really mature offensive player who knows that he can move the ball and get it back and affect the game that way. So I, I, I mean, it was, I thought offensively, particularly with attacking, he looked like a freshman today, uh, a really good freshman, but still a freshman and a guy who was not as mature as we've seen earlier. And a lot of that had to do with the way Butler was defending him. They were very physical, very aggressive, uh, and, and they were, you know, up on him and not letting him catch the ball, uh, gather it, excuse me, gather it and then attack. And, and, um, I think that that was the really the key for Butler on him was they just weren't letting him get catch the ball and get comfortable before making move. They were right up on him as soon as he caught it and not letting him settle in. So um, yep. kudos to them defensively for making him look that way. But at the same time, you know, he's got to rise above that because big 10 teams aren't going to be easy. On yep. Him. All right. Coming up as we continue our breakdown of Indiana's 71 to 68 victory over Butler, I will point out today's meaningful moment you might have missed. And then we will go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from this game. You are listening to the assembly call. Stick with us. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips, and we are breaking down Indiana's thrilling, in some ways improbable, 71 to 68 victory over Butler today in the Crossroads Classic. Yet there another. Never, there was never a doubt, Morris. What are you talking about? <laughs> never a doubt. Never a doubt. Uh, wow. I believe that this victory pulls Indiana into a tie with Butler for the best record in the Crossroads Classic, too. I'm pretty sure. I think both teams are now six and two. Yes. In the Crossroads no, six Classic. and three. Six and three. Yes. Yeah, no. Six wait, and wait, three. wait. 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 This is only the eighth year, I thought. Maybe five and I don't know. Anyway, I think, I think we're in a tie. Three. Yeah, I, I think we're in a tie. We're with four Butler. and three. We're five and three now. Yeah. Okay, five and three. So time for today's meaningful moment that you might have missed. There are a couple that I want to point out. One kind of harkens back to what we were talking about with you know Jawan Morgan and how he carried Indiana. At the under 12 minute timeout, it was 15 to six Butler. They were absolutely dominating. I, I mean, again, just absolutely taking it to Indiana. Juwan had gotten a little bit of a rest. You know, I, I thought it was smart when Joey Brunk came in early, Archie sat him. Brunk, the better offensive player, draws, you know, six and a half fouls per 40 minutes. And I thought it was going to be interesting what Indiana would do when he was on the court. Archie sat Juwan, put Duran in there. I thought that was really helpful to not get Juwan a second foul. Juwan comes back in, and we went right to him. He hit a two, then he drained a three on the next possession, and then he scored again uh, when he got ISOed on Fowler, took him to the bucket. Seven straight points. That made it 17-13, to 13, and I thought that was really important early just to kind of make sure that you keep Butler within – you know, with an eye shot, you know, don't let them run away with this thing because, you know, that's kind of what it looked like might happen with the way Indiana came out. So that was really important, an important stretch from Juwan. Now, Ryan, you know, one thing I want to talk about is in the second half, I got a meaningful moment. Oh, you do? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to want to chime in here. OK, well, I had uh, another one, but no, let's do yours. Okay. Oh, OK, well, I thought, you know, we we're to, you talk, I talk, you know. Uh, our chemistry is <laughs> off without the third guy. It's it's um, the chemistry that the three of you have three, yes, not two. <laughs> uh, no, it, the what I thought was the most meaningful moment was when Juwan stole the ball and had that breakaway, and it was yeah. clearly an intentional foul on Butler. It was a chance to go in for a layup and tie. I thought it was clearly an intentional foul. It should have been two shots in the ball. They didn't call it that. Uh, typically I'm okay with that, but when you're clearly grabbing a guy and he's the last and you know, you're protecting the rim that way, that that's an intentional foul. Uh, yeah. but Juwan stepped up and, and it almost felt like Butler was daring him because of his free throw percentage to hit the free throws and you know, yeah, sure. Okay. We'd rather have you hit the free throws than to make than try a layup. They he, don't realize Indiana's shooting like 90% since Archie went crazy on the sidelines at the end of last went, game. <laughs> Stepped up to the line and hit both free throws and tied the game. And I thought that was huge psychologically that IU tied the game with those free throws. Yeah. Their leader stepped up and hit them when he needed to. And also that they finally tied the game because they had been so close so many times. If you miss another opportunity to tie the game and let's say Butler comes down and makes a basket, then you're back down four or five. And it's, you know, it, it, so I thought yeah. psychologically just tying the game at that point. First of all, the crowd got into it. And then I think that even though they trailed after that and then came back and took a lead and whatever, it was the psychological factor of, okay, we finally zeroed this game out. We have tied it. We've come all the way back. 
you know, we're in this. And and finally getting over that hump was a huge yeah. deal, I thought, mentally for the team. No, that, no, that I mean, that's a great one that you bring up. And the reason why that happened is at about the 530 mark, Indiana cut it to 61 to 60. And, you know, it kind of felt like Indiana had the momentum. The offense is going. Romeo and Juwan had been going. We had three possessions to take the lead because we played good defense. You know, we were rebounding, cleaning up the glass. Three possessions to take the lead. No shots for Romeo or Juwan. I don't remember the shots off the top of my head. I think Justin Smith took one. I think maybe we had a turnover on one. One of them might have been when Justin Smith got the charge. So that was just a bad call. But still, you know, you get in that kind of a situation late in the game Romeo or Juwan have to be getting shots. And that was, again, just kind of a sign of some of the disjointedness of Indiana's offense because, you know, it's going to be easy to say, oh, you know, Indiana wins another close game. They must have played perfectly down the stretch. Not really. Like, they made some big plays, obviously, and hit some big shots. But even at the end of the game when they were closing it out, there were some really poor offensive possessions. I mean really poor, like where you're kind of pulling your hair out, like what on earth are we doing? And I thought that three-possession stretch was really key – because you got to get your guys the ball there, you know? And so, you know, we'd have to go back and watch the film, and I'm sure Butler was overplaying them and doing everything they could to deny it to them. But I would like to see us get a little bit better in those situations without having to take a timeout to get settled in to get into the offense and get those guys the ball because I still think, like, that's kind of a weakness that we have, and it really showed its, you know, reared its ugly head there. But to our credit, the defense had picked up, and, and Butler wasn't able to take advantage until McDermott hit that transition three. Yeah, I, 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 just in general. Also, I think that our last turnover came with like five minutes left or something. That was another key sort of moment that they really locked in offensively and stopped turning the ball over. I think even if you get empty possessions, at least you're making the defense work. When you just throw the ball out of bounds or, or throw it right to them, you're really kind of doing their work for them. So I thought that was huge just to kind of make Butler run off screens and make them you know, have to hustle and, and move. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I just a couple – you know, really nice moments in that second half that really locked Indiana in. Let's talk about some numbers here, Ryan. You know, a couple of the numbers that really jump out, the shooting. It, you know, look, Indiana came into this game 110th in the country in three-point shooting, two percentage points better than average. That's not great, but it's decent. It's solid. And I think we've all kind of been wondering, like, is this sustainable? Can we keep shooting, you know, the three-pointers as well, especially after how bad we were last year? Today, Indiana goes nine for 21. It's 43%. So our season percentage will go up. And we needed those. I mean, we really needed to have a good three-point shooting game today. I'm not ready to say this is a good three-point shooting team yet, but we're certainly much improved from last year. And a part of it is, you know, the offense is generating some good looks from three. And the guys are stepping up and making them. So that was good to see. Eight of ten from the free throw line. On the one hand, this is good because we made 80%. On the other hand, I think this is a sign of how Butler really forced us to play their game for most of the night. Because their biggest key, you know, you heard Lavelle Jordan talk on the pregame show, his biggest key was keep Indiana off the free throw line. Because we've been a team that has lived at the free throw line, it's what we want to do. For us to only get 10 free throws, that's not playing the kind of game we want to play. You know, we don't want to be a team. Attack, we're a team that attacks the paint and doesn't get Yeah. Good. Well, and look, I mean, for, you know, for a lot of the first half, we weren't really doing that. We were playing inside with Juwan Morgan, and he was getting it, but we weren't really able to get some of the drives that we had been getting in the past. So, you know, so that wasn't good. On the other plus side offensively, we had 18 assists on 27 made field goals. Three Romeo guys. had four. Rob had five. And, you know, I, I, I saw some people in the chat kind of wondering why Devontae Green was on there at the court at the end you know Devonte had five assists Devonte had three rebounds he was solid defensively I thought I, he played very good defense actually. yeah and, and look I you know a couple of his shots were questionable he had the one where he passed up the open three and he ends up taking a really bad floater a little bit later but I think it's so easy to kind of criticize Devonte. I thought he did some good things and the other thing is what's your alternative because Zach McRoberts was not going to shoot the ball. I mean, he was a total non-factor offensively. And Al Durham was totally taken out of the game by a team playing physical defense, which, as we've talked about, is an issue for him. So you needed another ball handler on the court. And Devontae, kind of by default, was the, the, the best of those options. And I, you know... Yeah, the last possession, he probably, you know, he wasn't able to get the ball to Romeo and almost dribbled us right out of being able to get a shot. But I thought he showed some improvement today. How many turnovers did he have? He only had one, one turnover. So I, I thought, you, I thought he did show IU, some. If you ask an average IU fan how many turnovers did Devontae have, they'd probably be like, oh, four. He had yeah. one. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought he was solid. I mean, he led us in plus minus at seven. 
And again, an imperfect stat, but it just shows you that when he was on the floor, you know, some good things were happening. And so I don't, I don't question that. I thought he should have been on the floor at the end because I thought we need, <clears throat> we needed another ball handler and the other guys weren't getting it done. Yeah. And, and that's, that was kind of my stat and my key stat that I was going to go with is that there were three guys with four more assists and his Langford had four fantasy had five and Devontae green had five and Devontae green five with one turnover. I mean, that's, what you want out of a guy who's going to be handling the ball. Like, yeah, he's kind of loose with the ball sometimes, but he wasn't actually losing it. Um, now that needs to get better because it takes you yeah. out of your rhythm when you lose, when you, the ball comes loose, but at least he's not giving it to the other team. And I thought he hit a big three in the first, I think it was the first half where he hit that big three. Uh, just kind of, we were struggling, 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 hit a three to kind of settle things down a little. Uh, and I thought he made some good passes on the interior. Um yeah, so I, I I did not have a problem with Devontae today. I would have rather had it, as you said, I would have rather had him on the floor than Zach McRoberts. McRoberts plays great defense, and he did well rebounding the ball. He had five. He's rebounds. not playing great defense yet, though. I That's thought he thing, did. Man. I thought he did today. I thought he played solid defense. It w- <laughs> solid, yes, yeah, solid. solid. But but again, the, the argument becomes: if he's not playing great defense, and he's just not going to look at the basket, can you have him out there? Like credit to him, he had that great hustle play in the first half to get the rebound. I thought that got us going. But I don't see the great defense yet, and maybe he's just not in rhythm. But that's something to watch for because it's going to be hard played, for him to get minutes unless he's playing great defense. Yeah, no, I thought he played good defense today. I mean, I don't know if it's superlative or shutdown or whatever you want to call How it. How many I'd more have, adjectives can we come yeah, up with? Yeah, I'd have to go defense. rewatch the game to sort of get in, get on your level with the adjective there, Jared. But, uh, but no, I I thought he played solid defense. I thought he was in the right position most most of the game. Um, but also, you're right. Offensively, I, I, I tweeted this out. He's an empty jersey offensively right now. He moves the ball, and that's good. But when everybody else can score and you can't, your defender will sag off of you and help out. And especially when you've got Jawan Morgan on the floor, who they need somebody to double with. If you're an empty suit offensively, uh, you know what? What they're just going to have you send your guy to double, and you're going to have nothing. You know, you're not going to offer anything. So I agree with you on that. And they were doubling for a couple games. They were doubling with Justin Smith's guy, and he's made it so they can't do that. So Zach needs to follow that plan and step up uh, offensively. Uh, some other numbers, you know, and I thought this was a really well, thought, important. Can oh. I give? Can I give one real quick? It's of course, uh, yeah. The fact that we shot 42.9% from three and Butler shot 40% from three. They're a three-point shooting team. They're a good three-point shooting team. IU outshot them today. And then and it wasn't just percentage. It was volume, too. Yeah. They made 10. We made nine. So it was yeah. close in volume. And matched them, yeah. And then also the field goal percentage. Indiana shot 51.9%, which, by the way, is ridiculous. These guys are making yeah. their shots this year. It's ridiculous. Butler shot 43.1%. And then I thought the... And we another, had six block shots, right? Yeah, six block yeah. shots. Uh, I, I thought another one was Butler is known as a team that moves the ball, that assists on their buckets, all that stuff. Indiana 18 assists, Butler had seven. So they stayed with them in every statistical category and also to finish the game um, out rebounding Butler 33 to 31 when Butler got 11 offensive rebounds, mostly from long yep. rebounds. The fact that Indiana wound up locking in and out rebounding them and not giving them second chance points late in the game uh, was really key, I thought. Yeah, that's the one that I was going to get to because I thought it was a big part of the turnaround. Butler finished with 11 offensive rebounds. They had ten, they had seven offensive rebounds at the half, they, and they got a few more right at the start of the second half. So Indiana just absolutely shut them down. And again, I give Romeo some credit for this because he got some really tough defensive rebounds. But they had 12 second-chance points in the first half. Yeah, Rob did too. Uh, they had 12 second-chance points in the first half. They did not get any second-chance points in the second half. So, you know, look, I, I talked about this on the halftime report. There was a lot about this game that felt like the Louisville game. Louisville came out in the first half against Indiana, out-toughed us, out-quicked us, just kind of looked like they wanted it a little bit more. We matched it in the second half, and our superior talent eventually won out, and we won the game. I thought of kind of the very same thing happened here today. You know, Butler was playing better. They were doing more what they wanted to do. They were playing harder. They were getting all the 50-50 balls. You know, they weren't turning it over. We were. In the second half, it took us a few minutes to get into it, but then we matched them. And at the end of the day, you know, if those things are going to be even— and we talked about this before the season started. You know, why do you feel good about Indiana? It's like, well, because on most nights, we're going to have the two best players on the court, and sometimes that's good enough. And so when all that other stuff was even, now the fact that we had Jawan Morgan and Romeo Langford, you know, you end up winning the game. Now, obviously, other guys had to step up and make plays, but Indiana, 
you know, I think what will allow this team to take the next step? Because I, I think this team right now is the 24th, 25th, 26th best team in the country. I think that's right where we are. I think what can take us to the next step is instead of playing, you know, tough and physical and really executing for 25 minutes, for 30 minutes, start to do it for 35 minutes. You know, heck, maybe even put together a full 40 minutes because we're beating good teams you know, almost tying a hand behind our back with some of these starts and with some of the unforced errors and some of the easily correctable things like effort and toughness and focus that we can do because we see it. We're just not doing it for the full game. So this was another game like that. And as you look for, you know, areas where Indiana needs to grow, things to work on over these next couple games and as Big Ten play starts, it's playing for 35, 40 minutes instead of 30 minutes like we're doing and just doing enough to win these games. So... Yeah, you'd like it to be sort of, you know, a, a more smooth situation. But I'll take wins over anything. And and you're right. Yeah. I think uh, the team does need to sort of round into form because, you know, they are sitting about the 20th to 25th best team in the country right now, and they're playing like it. But they've got a couple games to really sort of settle some things over the next two weeks and then head into a Big Ten season. So, well, let's see. Let's see what happens next. I, I, I just right now, if we told you at the beginning of the year that we'd be nine and two after the Crossroads Classic, I think everybody would have taken that for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and again, you know, you talked about after the Duke game, it does not matter what happened tonight. It matters what's hap- what happens from here on out. Indiana's won four straight games. They've all been close. They've all been flawed. They've all been frustrating. They've all made us pull our hair out but it's four straight wins. And as you said, winning in different ways and winning with a different mentality. And that's good. So I get the frustration. I saw it all on Twitter today. I understand how imperfect this team is, but there are a lot of things to feel good about too. And let's Um, make sure that we remember that. Let's remember the injury and the team hasn't had enough guys to practice fully and all that stuff. And, you know, Actually, why, why are we begging people to see the positive? Your team's nine and two, and you're in the top twenty-five. If you can't see it, that's on you. I'm, exactly. I'm actually I'm sick of begging people to see the positives. Actually, thank you. Not, screw finally, that. Finally, finally, I'm, you're I'm on done. My... Sorry, I'm done. Finally, you're on my level with that. <laughs> I'm really shut up, people. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the basketball. That's right. That's right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Coming up on the assembly call, we continue our breakdown of Indiana's victory over Butler. We need to talk about some of the guys off the bench. Talk about Al Durham. Uh, and all the other storylines from this game. That is coming next here on the Assembly Call. Stick with us. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night and Monday afternoon at our website, assemblycall.com. And while you're there, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 6,000 of your fellow IU fans are subscribed. It'll make you a smarter IU basketball fan. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Ryan Phillips. We're breaking down Indiana's 71 to 68 victory over Butler, the fourth straight victory for the Hoosiers. Um, Ryan, let's talk real quick about Rob Finnessy's day because it's really easy to focus on the end of the game, the great assist that he had, uh, the, you know, the steal that he had on Kamar Baldwin late when Kamar Baldwin dry, drove was really good. Obviously, the three. But I thought go all the way back to the first half. There was a long stretch where Rob didn't play, and I don't know if he was benched or not. He played what 27 minutes. But his defense to come out of the gate was not good. He was not containing dribblers. He was not defending ball screens very well. And my hunch is that that's why he got taken out of the game. And, you know, we've kind of seen him be a guy who starts a little bit slow. Obviously, he always comes through at the end of the game. And, I mean, just look at the numbers, nine points, five boards, five assists. You know, only had one turnover, made the big play, uh, you know, had that big steal. So he ends up with a very solid day. And once again, I was just I was kind of impressed that he was able to shake off kind of a, a slow start. And I thought he really got back into the game at the very end of the first half, because right before the under four minute timeout, Kamar Baldwin kind of started to get going and they Rob came back in the game and they put him on Kamar. 
And, you know, Kamar was able to drive and get him down on the block some, but I thought Rob really did a nice job of beating him to spots, playing physical, and really making him earn it and make Kamar take some tough turnaround shots that, you know, he made a few of them, but he missed a lot of them too. And so an imperfect and uneven day for Rob that ended great, but once again, he just he's a guy who can shake off a rough start to just kind of be that solid, steady guy that Indiana needed because you got the star turn from Juwan. Romeo did just enough, and you needed another guy to step up late, and Rob was the guy who did that. Yeah, and, and nine points, they all came on threes. He was three or six from three, but he really couldn't finish inside. One of the things that's been so impressive about him is his ability to finish at the rim in traffic even and guard it. Uh, so we really didn't get that today, but nine points, five rebounds, five assists, a steal. Only one turnover was huge as well. Um, so I, I really was impressed with the way he handled himself in on that stage as a freshman going up against a junior who, in Kamar Baldwin. I think Baldwin's a junior, right? Yes. I don't know. I'll look. He? You, I'll, you um, look. You talk. I'll look. But he, uh, he's yeah, a junior. junior. Uh, so a veteran guy who's a good player for Butler, and I thought he played pretty well. And I, I agree. I think the defense was really good late uh, for for Rob forcing him. I mean, I know Baldwin made a couple shots, but I, I, Rob really forced him into tough situations. And that that last drive and layup. I mean, there's nothing else you can do on that. And Jawan came over to help, and that really high banking layup that that Baldwin hit. I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. It was just a really good shot. And then at the end, having the confidence to be the guy to come over and say, give me the ball. I need to, someone needs to shoot it. And to have the confidence that look, it was a bit of a prayer of a shot, but you know sure. what? It went in and he had the guts to take it. And as a freshman to do that uh, at that arena, in that situation on national television. And it looked I, good. Like it was, it wasn't a fluky release or anything. No, I mean, I mean, he was he able to elevate double, and get a good shot. Yeah. He kind of double clutched a little, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, I mean, he stepped into it and, and shot it. So it, just having the guts to step up and do that, especially on a team with a guy like Juwan Morgan, not trying to get the ball and then force it to him or, you know, oh, somebody take this. Uh, he was willing to take it. So um, he did say after the game that they were trying to get the ball to Romeo. I think somebody overplayed a screen or maybe they hadn't been switching all game and they switched all of a sudden. And so that yeah. kind of blew the play up because uh, it looked like they were overplaying Romeo. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, it was kind of confusion. When you drop a play in 30 seconds and you're going to run it and it gets screwed up, that happens in basketball. I saw some people complaining about the last play designed by Archie, and it's like, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> it's it, it, these, th That happens all the time. When you take 30 seconds to draw up a play, everyone and expect everybody to be on the same page immediately. I mean, and, you would hope it's something that you've done before, practiced before, and you're kind right. of drawing it up and to I'm remind sure was, you about it. But. but here's the thing is a lot of times when they draw up a last second play like that, yeah, it's a version of something you've done before, but there's usually a tweak in yeah. it like, hey, to make sure this guy specifically gets the ball as opposed to somebody else. And so, you know, you, you, you have it set on the sideline and then Butler throws something at you they haven't done all game it throws you off. It can screw things up. And especially if you're on the floor, you're like, well, no, the whole point is to get it to this one guy. Let's try and force it to him. And then that's not there. You kind of get bailed out. You have to look for somebody to bail you out. So that's why fantasy came over to get the ball from Devante. Uh, Justin Smith. I thought there were a few things to be encouraged by. He hit a big three. You know, Absolutely. he made he made another uh, you know long two pointer that was nice to see. He continues to be a guy that just looks painfully uncomfortable anytime he has to dribble and drive to the basket. And it's like he wants to, he wants to figure out how to be a guy who can drive to the basket, and he just can't. And, and look, the the charge call at the end that was a crap call Four. that wasn't really on him. But it's almost like the refs have been conditioned to think Justin is out of control when he's dribbling, and they just called the charge. Um, so he's got to get better at that. Again, you know, he was better as just a spot up guy and a guy cutting. And maybe he just needs to focus on doing that, you know, and, and make that where he's getting his offense. You know, defensively, I, I agree with you. I don't think anybody really did a great job on McDermott. He probably did the best job of at least being able to recover and help and close out tough. McDermott's just a great shooter. Uh, and we saw more turnovers. So I don't – Well, th th one th of those this wasn't necessarily a huge step back from the progress we saw against Penn State and Louisville, but it wasn't – I don't know about that. I'm just I, saying well, I think I, it was just I'm kind of another game like those. You I'm can disagree. Dis I am <laughs> absolutely disagreeing with you. Oh, I know I can disagree. I quite often do. Uh, no, I thought for Justin, uh, one of the turnovers was that offensive foul that was terrible. Yeah. One of them was a drive where the ball he just lost control of the ball, and that was in the first half. Uh, I don't remember the third one, but I'm sure it didn't make me happy at the time. But the fact that he had the confidence to step into that three and hit it. And it was a big three at the time. That was a big the, shot. The fact that he had the confidence to hit a jumper, like 
we're looking for baby steps in his game to get better and better and better. And those are two really good signs. And, you know, four rebounds, one of them was offensive, only two fouls. And then I thought, I did think he played good defense on McDermott 90% of the time. McDermott hit a three with uh, Smith guarding him, but that was because Smith had to race back because he beat Juwan back to guard the bucket. And there was somebody. We did have to help a lot today because we weren't containing dribblers that well. And there was somebody, well, he had to help back on a, on a breakaway and on a fast break, he covered the hoop and then they passed it cross court to McDermott. He didn't have time to close out. That's the only three that I saw, you know, when he was specifically guarding McDermott that he hit. So I, you know, I, I got to give him credit for playing well there. He's played good defense for most of the year and it's getting better. And then the fact that he stepped into those shots and made them was, was a big deal as well. Yeah. The, the shooting was definitely huge to see. Let's talk about some other guys. Um, Al Durham, was you know look we talked on our last show we gave out grades and the reason why I couldn't give Al an A despite the fact that he's been really solid for most of the year is that the first half against Duke and against Arkansas which were you know the teams that probably played Indiana the most physical defensively other than maybe Louisville he really shrunk from the moment and wasn't able to get in the game today he only plays 18 minutes takes three shots misses them all doesn't get a rebound really just struggled to get going at all and so, you know, and we'll talk about this with Evan Fitzner too. You know, Al, if he's going to be a starter, has to be able, has to be less, his production has to be less matchup dependent. And right now it's pretty matchup dependent. And when he gets in a game like this, he can't hang yet. And look, he's, you know, still kind of a, a, a spindly guy physically who's a sophomore and still kind of, you know, growing into that. So I think this is the next step for him. But today was the reason why, you know, you still kind of question that um, with him. So he's been really good this year. Today was not one of his better days, and that's why we didn't see him play all that much in the second half and why down the stretch Devontae Green was the guy out there because Devontae Green was more ready for this moment than Al Durham was. So a learning experience for Al, hopefully, and I'm sure it will be because he's a guy who is humble and learns from his mistakes. Yeah, I look, it was just a, a tough matchup for Al today. And guys have bad games. I mean, it just happens. Like, you know, you're not going to be perfect every game. Sometimes you're going to go out and have a bad Deron okay, Davis. And, and hold on, hold on. There are bad games, and there are, I guess the difference with Al is it's not just that, like, like Romeo had kind of a bad game today, but he still did stuff. When Al has a bad game, he doesn't, like, he's almost non existent. That's the thing, is in these types of matchups, like, he needs to find a way to get rebounds or, you know, get to the line or I get an assist that, or two. Right? That's the difference. That's what I'm allowed, saying. If you would have allowed me to finish, because, you know, I never interrupt you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's rich <laughs> coming from you. <laughs> uh, but, no, I just – he had a bad game. It, it happens, and I understand what you're saying about you need to find things. to. But he had a bad game, and he had a bad game in which he didn't do much. Uh, Deron Davis had a bad game. Yeah. And I think that it was just a weird matchup for Deron more than anything because Butler's – post guys move around a lot and also it was probably a lot of well we want you on morgan in the post right now so having to run on the court is not a good idea and they went smaller and you know what with justin smith sort of as a power forward and and you know morgan is the center basically uh but that happens it, it just happens and you, that's going to happen several times a year for each of these guys is you're going to have a tough game and the key is, of course, as we've said many times, it's not the game that you have. It's how you bounce back from it. And does Al improve his game because of this? Does he watch the film and realize, OK, I need to be you know, more physical. I need to grab more rebounds. As you said, I need to move the ball more. He's short armed to three. Uh, yeah, one of that was a big shot, too. And it was a really bad short arm, too. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, he stepped into it. He was open and he just barely hit the front of the rim. So there's just some stuff he's got to work on. And again, you're, you can stomach that when the team wins. Like, it's not as big a deal because they wound up winning. But at the same time, if this rears its head in the middle of Big Ten play and you look back at the Butler game and say, oh, he played just like he did in the Butler game, that's bad because, you know, you want him to be improving on these. And so if he has a bad game, you're right. You want him to be grabbing rebounds or getting in passing lanes and getting steals and some other things that might help. Yeah. Uh uh, look, Evan Fitzner, real quick, he played nine minutes, two points, was a non-factor, did not get any rebounds. He was the only Hoosier who played other than Al who didn't get a rebound. There was one possession in particular where he whiffed on two rebounds on the defensive end, and Joey Bronk just out-hustled him to him. I don't know if he played again after that, if, if the possession that I'm thinking about is is correct. Um, again, this just kind of not a good matchup for him. You know, he had the one really nice post move, the majestic post move. He scored on it. And other than that, was kind of a non-factor. Was 
Yeah, well, you know, he wasn't able to get himself open from three. It's ironic that in a game where Indiana's three-point shooting essentially kept them alive, Evan Fitzner didn't even take one. And he, he was one of only two players, Deron Davis being the other, who didn't even take a three. And he's the guy who was brought in to be the three-point shooter. So, again, a tough matchup for him. But, you know, and this, these are the things that you learn about your team 11 games into the season. You know, you know, for individual guys, what are the tough matchups? I think we're learning that, you know, for guys like Evan, for guys like Al, the matchups they're really going to struggle with. Um, you know, so not, not a great day for Evan. Uh, and then, you know, with McRoberts, one thing I did want to add on him is – he did rebound well. He had five rebounds, and again, there was a stretch there where Indiana was struggling. He had with a the few rebounding eight too. Yeah, he did. Uh, you know, four of his his rebounds were defensive, and the one offensive one that he had was just straight hustle. That was you know that was terrific. So it, it wasn't that Zach. He did some Zach McRoberts things. It's just that the defense wasn't as good as it's been, and the shooting that we hope to see wasn't there. So we're still kind of waiting to see that. Maybe it's because of the injury, but Archie also said that he had a great week of practice and really expected him to kind of hit the ground running in this game. So, you know, just he's he's got some things to to improve on. Um, any other thoughts on the guys coming off the bench? Not really. I mean, I think we pretty much covered it. I think that because uh, we already hit Devonte Green, and there's yeah. not much to say about the the other guys. I mean, that we haven't already talked about. So, um, yeah, I think that's about it. I, I I really think that the bench needs to get more solidified. I think. Um, that these guys all need to sort of find their role. And and the fact that Duran Davis didn't do much, I mean, he had two blocks and two rebounds and an assist, but the fact that he didn't do much offensively really hurts the bench's totals because you expect him to do better than that. I thought, I thought he would too. I thought this would be a better game for him. And it I thought defensively like he did some things, yeah. but he just wasn't able to get going. Yeah. And part of that is the fact that Morgan was dominating on the block. Why take him out? You know? Yeah. And I mean, when he's in there, why not give him the ball? every single time because he was he was doing great all right let's um let's move on to the next segment coming up in our final segment we're going to hand out our game ball that should be easy we'll take a quick look ahead uh to what's coming up for indiana and then in our last call we would deliver our final thoughts on indiana's big victory over butler that's next on the assembly call stick with us Listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I am Jared Morris. I'm here with Ryan Phillips. We are wrapping up our breakdown of Indiana's 71 to 68 victory over Butler. Big Shot Rob does it again, drains the three in the closing seconds to give Indiana the win in the Crossroads Classic with Victor Oladipo looking on. A, uh, a feathery win for the Hoosiers with Victor in attendance. Uh, Ryan, it is that time of the show where we hand out our game balls coming into today. Romeo's been chosen for four. Juwan's won three. Deron Davis has been given two game balls, and Rob Finnessy has won. I'm thinking Juwan might even things up today. What do you say? Yeah, I'm giving it to Juwan. <laughs> Juwan won today, easily, clearly. I, I don't know how you could give it to anybody else. I mean, Rob with a big shot again. Um, but, I mean. No. 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 no, I, no. I love Rob. Great shot. No. No. Juwan. Uh, Again, you know, th there are some things that you can quibble with with Juwan, but the, the load that he carried offensively and just I think, you know, the, I don't know if confidence is the right word because Indiana didn't necessarily play confident in the first half, but just the fact that they could lean on him to keep them in it when nothing else was going well. And look, you know, I think today kind of shows you maybe what could have been different in the Arkansas game, and maybe even the Duke game a little bit. I mean, Indiana wasn't going to beat Duke, and they probably weren't going to come within you know 15 of Duke. But maybe if Juwan's out there for the whole first half and able to hit some buckets and go on a little stretch offensively, you know, the deficit against Arkansas isn't as big, or or against Duke today. And you saw it. You know, he was really smart early on, avoiding fouls and not getting the silly ones, not getting the little reach in fouls, not reaching for, you know, an offense uh, for a rebound and, and getting a foul and his ability to stay on the floor when nothing else was working so that he could, you know, score seven straight points when it's 15 to six and keep Indiana alive. That was huge. And so, you know, he has clearly, you know, the two big things that we talked about him needing to improve, stay on the court, make your free throws. He did that today. No coincidence that he, you know, in a season of really strong performances from him, you know, he authored his best one and Indiana needed every ounce of it to win the game. Yeah. And um, 
35 points. I mean, come on, man. That's ridiculous in college. It really is. It is. 12 of 14. Only two misses were from beyond the arc. Seven to seven from the free throw line. Only three rebounds, but an assist, two steals, two blocks. Uh, he, he, yeah, he was the best player on the floor today. And I'd argue that he was the best player on the floor. And Romeo was probably the second best player on the floor. And Indiana needs that. And Romeo didn't even have a great game. But I just thought, yeah, both of those guys. And also, if you look at it, though, Morgan and Langford combined for nine of IU's 15 turnovers. Uh, yeah, that's kind of shocking, but the fact that they could win and those guys could make winning plays while not, you know, while turning the ball over and making mistakes shows that there's stuff to improve on. And they were bad turnovers too. I mean, mm-hmm. they, I think the part, in the second yeah. half they had five of them and they were all on passes. You know, Morgan had the one where he thought Romeo was going to go back door and he didn't, you know, Romeo had a couple passes. Just like, what are you thinking now? You know, you, you don't excuse necessarily turnovers like that because they can't happen and Indiana has to clean up the turnovers. But, you know, when when you're the two guys that are basically doing everything offensively, I give you I cut you a little bit of slack if you are trying to make plays and you you make a bad one, you know, because you have so much pressure. So I think as, as we look forward for Indiana, you know, and, and some of the improvements that Indiana needs to make coming out of this game, you know, we, we talked about getting off to better starts. We've talked about the turnovers. You know, we know all of those things. I think the other thing that really needs to emerge for this team, Ryan, is a consistent third score, especially a guy that can hopefully be counted on early in a game, you know, because we haven't seen that. Rob Finnessy has been a guy who has scored points late, but it seems to take him a while to kind of get into the game from a scoring perspective. Justin hasn't been that guy. Sometimes Al is that guy. Every now and then, Evan's that guy off the bench, you know. So it's, and then some guys, no one emerges like today. So as as we look for the path for Indiana to go from being a top twenty five team to potentially a top fifteen, top ten team that competes for a Big Ten title, that really needs to emerge. And it's one of the things that hasn't yet. On most nights, Romeo and Juwan will probably be enough to win, but I think a third guy is going to need to consistently step up. Um, and whether that's a different guy every night or the same guy, preferably it'll be the latter. But I think Indiana really needs that. I think that's fair. I think they they do need a third score. But as long as somebody does it, I don't think it needs to be somebody consistently. In fact, it might be better for your team if it's a different guy every night helping out. I mean, I agree you want to have the people you rely on, but let's say Deron Davis can get you 10 points every night and five rebounds, six rebounds. You'll take that. But yeah, if he does, if he does it one night. <laughs> Or Justin Smith does it one night. Rob Finnessy does it one night. I mean, you're not going to – that's not going to upset me too much if it's different guys doing it, different people stepping up, depending on them, because it's going to depend on the matchups, I think. Yeah. Um, I went into the, the Ken Palm stats have updated real quick. What was Butler from the free throw line tonight? Oh, they were two for two. So Butler – yeah, they, I mean, that. You know, so that's another plus for Indiana is being able to defend without fouling, not putting them on the line. Um, Indiana 24th now in Ken Palm, you know, a couple of numbers that stand out again. I talked about the three point shooting Were they favored in Ken Palm today. Uh, it was 50, 50%. So Ken Palm gave them, you know, one, uh, they predicted a one point victory for Indiana, but it was, it was a 50, 50 ball game. Um, you know, Indiana now 83rd in the country in terms of three point shooting percentage. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if that continues, you know, because there are, there are a few kind of strange stats right now that when you're a team that's winning close games can have a big impact. For one thing, Indiana's opponents are shooting 61.9% from the free throw line. That's ninth best in the country. I'd love to give Indiana credit for great free throw defense, but that's probably kind of a fluky stat that will even out some. So that's why it's especially important that Indiana's free throw shooting improve. Obviously, you know, the three-point shooting, uh, Indiana 83rd, we are now 39th in the country in three-point defense, giving up 29.2%, and that's with Butler's 40% in there. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably due for a little bit of a regression, you know, as teams start shooting a little bit better. So there are some things, there are some reasons to think that, like, I don't, I don't want to say Indiana's luck in close games, because I don't think Indiana's winning these games because of luck. I think we're executing, we're making big plays. But when the margins are this thin and you've been seeing some of the shooting percentages by opponents that Indiana has, you have to expect those shooting percentages to go up just, you know, kind of like a law of averages type thing. So Indiana is going to have to get more solid at not giving away possessions and at doing some of the other little things if they're going to keep playing these close games to win them. Because at some point the ball will bounce in a way that isn't favorable to Indiana at the end of the game. So it's not to take anything away from them on this four game winning streak. But you are playing with a little bit of fire playing this many close games. You look at Archie Miller's history as a coach. His teams have traditionally done very well in close games. In fact, he's one of, I think, 13 or 14 coaches in the country. They're 60% or better in close games. 
So you can have confidence, but again, Indiana's going to need to clean up some of these issues as they start facing tougher competition in the Big Ten, um, and you know some of these other numbers revert a little bit. Any any other storylines, Ryan, that we didn't hit that we need to get to here? No, I just think that the the basic bottom line here is that Indiana finds a way to win again, and you know that you can't count this team out. You really can't. They played hard down the stretch, and just they out. You know, out hustled and outworked Butler, who out hustled and outworked them for at least the first twenty five minutes, and and Indiana really turned it up, and uh, that's a really good team. Indiana is a really good team, and they're they're showing it. And really good teams know how to finish. Really good teams know how to win, and yes, they're looking like it right now. Yeah, and that's you know, I guess when I ranted earlier, that's what I wish Indiana fans would see is this is a really good team. This is not a great team. This is not an elite team. And some of the things that we've talked about, those are the path for this team to become that. Because I think they can. I think this team can become a great team. But right now, they are a really good team that has some flaws that are going to keep them from kind of taking that next step. So we'll see if Indiana can work on those. And Indiana is going to have some time now to work on those because the Hoosiers play two games next week. We have Central Arkansas on Wednesday. They are currently 274th in Ken Palm. And then Jacksonville on Saturday, they are 300th in Ken Palm. So these should be... You know, I mean, I hesitate to say easy games because the UT Arlington and UC Davis games, you know, they're a little bit higher ranked than these teams. Those games certainly weren't easy, but hopefully Indiana, you know, healthier, a little bit more in rhythm can really work on some of these things in in these games and work on the turnovers and and kind of work on coming out and playing, uh, you know, more solidly throughout the game. And then they have the long break from December 22nd to January 3rd when Big Ten play resumes against Illinois. Um, So three straight home games where Indiana is going to be a double digit favorite and a lot of things to work on to prepare for a gauntlet of games that begins after that. So we'll have uh, obviously post game shows after the Central Arkansas and after the Jacksonville games uh, and Assembly Call Radio and, and Banner Monday coming as well so that we can break down all that and see how the Hoosiers are doing uh, in the aftermath of this uh, four game winning streak. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU post game show. Remember that because you're an Assembly Call listener, you get 15% off your entire order at HoosierProud.com and at HomeFieldApparel.com. So if you want officially licensed IU gear, go to HomeFieldApparel.com. And if you want one of our Assembly Call logo t-shirts or one of Hoosier Proud's unique Indiana-inspired designs, visit HoosierProud.com on both sites. Use the promo code ASSEMBLY at checkout for 15% off your entire order. All right, Ryan, it is time for last call. Your final thoughts on today's victory over Butler. Big shot, big win. Loved it. Uh, big you 10. Know, <laughs> thanks, Dan. Uh, <laughs> big fan of the show, Dan Dockage. Uh, yeah, it, just a great win for Indiana to win it at, uh, you know, to win it up there, beggar's life, and, um, you know, win it in front of a great crowd, come back, fight their way through it, and uh, and come out with a victory is huge. And it was great to see a freshman step up and make the biggest play of the game. Says a lot for Indiana's future. And uh, it was also awesome to see all those former IU players uh, in, you know, there in person watching it. I thought that was great. It was great news for the program. And uh, I thought it was a great win for the program as well. Awesome job for those guys. They did a great job. Yeah, I saw a comment in the chat about how this win was luck. And obviously, we, we've talked a lot about why this win, you know, you make a shot like that. What, what, what are your expected percentages on that last shot by Rob Finnessy? 15%, you know, something like that. So obviously, it was unlikely for him to make that. If he misses it, at least Indiana was getting the last shot. So it was just going to be overtime if he did miss it. But, you know, what I want to say here is, you know, you don't win four straight close games against the caliber of competition that Indiana has won these games against with it just being luck. You know, we pointed out some of the things that Indiana did down the stretch, some of the corrections that they made, some of the issues that they that were that had been plaguing Indiana early in the game that they fixed to to correct it and to be able to come back and to be able to win this game. As we look towards the next steps for this team, this is a team that's going to be able to win close games. They're going to have confidence in close games. Now it needs to be something that Indiana leans on, not that they rely on. You know, right now for the last four games, Indiana has been relying on their ability to win close games because they haven't come out and played well at the beginning. They've allowed themselves to get down. They've, you know, gotten close. They've come back and then they have three, four possession stretches where they don't get the ball into the hands of their playmakers, but they're always able to do enough after that to win the game. And that's fine. And they're going to be able to lean on that and have confidence that when things are going bad, hey, we've won close games before. But now let's take the next step and let's play better the first 10 minutes 
and maybe be up by nine or 10 points with two minutes to go and not have to rely on our ability in close games. You know, save that for the games against Michigan and the games against Michigan State and the games against Wisconsin, some of the better teams on the schedule. That is how Indiana goes from being really good to great. We'll see. For Indiana to be really good right now after 11 games in the second season of Archie Miller's tenure, I think is a great place for the Hoosiers to be in. I'm very encouraged, I think, to be able to bounce back from the Duke loss and win four straight games no matter how you get them. That's encouraging. Now it's going to be really exciting to see if this Indiana team can take the next step because this team has a lot of ability, a lot of potential, a very high ceiling. And we're going to see now they've taken an important step to get here. Now we'll see if they have what it takes to take the, to take the next step to get there. And we look forward to uh, being here chronicling it uh, every step of the way. All right, and that'll do it for us on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. You can also subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening. We'll be back on Monday with a new edition of Banner Monday. We hope you'll join us. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim, and go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right, I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody who is here live. Huge live turnout today. Always great Saturday to see. Saturday afternoon. Those, nice uh, to see. The, those last second shots bring out the, uh, the big turnouts. <laughs> I remember during the watch shot, you had like four people listening. <laughs> hey, that was a record at the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That was fun. So, you going to take a show or two off next week? I may, yeah, just depending. I've got a kind of crazy work schedule. So, because we're not I mean, going to. We're not going to Connecticut, so I'm kind of getting stacked up with work because other guys are traveling and stuff. So, uh, but yeah, I'll be in touch. I don't know which days, but we'll figure it out. I'm not going anywhere for Christmas this year. Not no. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we can probably do even though it's weeknights and usually we can have three man shows. We can probably do two man shows for these games. Yeah, I don't think that's um, going to be a problem for what they are. Now, I mean, hopefully, they lose, hopefully. <laughs> now, if they lose, maybe I'll have to jump on. Please. Yeah, ho hopefully they are nice, pleasant, uh, nice, pleasant games where we can break down a nice deep bench. And what? You know. Okay, so was it Wednesday and Saturday? Wednesday and Saturday, yes. Okay, thought so. All right, yeah, I'll text you and let you know what the deal is. Okay. Yeah, I think Andy said he's good for both of those, I think. Okay. So, I need to go yeah, get something and I'm, I'm, I'm good sorry. for both of them. Get yourself some cereal. No, I'm going to go out. Get some, get a salad or something. Mm. Maybe, like, maybe it'll be a cereal for dinner night. <laughs> uh, Andy right. wanted to chime in here real quick. You guys covered it well. Oh, thank you. Andy. Yeah, thanks, Andy. We appreciate All the right. positive, positive Later, feedback. Everybody. All right. See you, Ryan. Later. See you, everybody. Thanks for being here. Have a great Saturday night. Go Hoosiers. <laughs>